Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. This episode is the second part of a two-part series with Professor Cecile Farb on economic statecraft and alternatives to war. You don't need to have listened to the first part, but we do set out a lot of the framework that we reference in this episode, so if you are interested, please feel free to go back and check that out if you haven't already. Just before we get started, a couple of announcements about where I'm going with the podcast in general. I've done some polling and got some feedback from people, and I think the general consensus is that we want to do sort of a mix of the solo episodes and the interviews. Some people really like solo episodes, some people really like interviews, but I think the sort of median position is a bit of both. So I think for the next few weeks, I'm going to do a few one-part solo series, solo episodes. So I did a Twitter poll, and I gave people several options, and the title for a solo episode that won was Mill vs. Rawls, which is, I already have that written in my head, I just need to go and get the quotes, I know exactly what I want to say about that. So I'll do that next week, and then I'll do a few others. I might do a follow-up where I look at, I do the application of some of the theoretical work I did in my humiliation episode, for people wondering I have not dropped that hobby horse, and that's coming back at some point. Also, We're going to have to... People have been tweeting at me, am I going to cover Brexit some more? Yes, definitely. And particularly if there's an election, I might do a solo episode of that where I sort of speak in my own voice and give my own point of view as to what I think is happening and who we should support in the fights to come. And I've been noticing the episodes that we've been doing on um, the 2020 presidential election have gotten a lot of views. So either solo or with a guest, I might have a look at that. And as always, I try to avoid just like straight punditry and only do something if I have something to say or a guest has something to say that adds a bit of depth or gives you maybe a new perspective on the same old talking points we hear from the particular candidates week in, week out. So I don't have a hard plan, but that's roughly where I'm thinking of going. And I do have some interviews with some really good people, in fact, lined up. So it won't be just solo episodes. I'll mix and match. But I think for the next few weeks, maybe even the next month or two, the primary focus will be sort of one part solo episodes, taking on particular things, particular topics, with some interviews mixed in for variety. And then towards the end of the year, I have been getting requests to do another of my big solo series where I do these huge deep dives on a particular thing. I'm still deciding the topic for the next one, and they're just so much work. It's like writing a book. I love doing it. But maybe November, December of this year, I might have one of those coming out. So that's what's coming up on the podcast. As always, if you want to support the show, please do share this episode. We've achieved some really remarkable growth in our numbers, and all of that is thanks to people just forwarding it on, hitting the share button, tagging friends, all of that good social media stuff. And if you are able to support the show in a more financial manner, that's certainly appreciated too. All of the costs associated with this podcast, which are, you know, not trivial, are covered by our listeners. We don't do any advertising, we don't have any sponsors, it's just big, engaged conversations brought directly to you without interruption. So if you'd like to help me continue doing that, please check out our Patreon page. I've been suggesting two bucks an episode, so... If what you're about to listen to is as energising and stimulating or as bitter and unpalatable as your morning cup of coffee that you pay two bucks for at Starbucks, consider sponsoring it on the same basis or whatever amount seems right to you. And once again, I am genuinely grateful to all of the supporters we have who do sponsor the show. I'm really, really grateful you are genuinely making this show possible. So let's get to it. 
This is, like I say, the second part of a two-part series with Professor Cecile Farb. In the first part, we sort of lay out the shop and go over a theory of rights, a theory of property rights, and how we think that should inform relations between states or even non-state actors. In this, we look at the enforcement of rights globally. What is there to say ethically about someone like the United States or even the United Nations? using mechanisms like sanctions, like conditional aid and lending, and like war, in order to protect and enforce human rights globally? How do we make sense of the epistemic uncertainty under which those actors must do it? And how complicated is the moral story by the fact that the actors who we might look to as potential enforcers of human rights have a pretty terrible record of human rights violations of their own? How far are the waters muddied by the charge of hypocrisy? We take all of that on. So that's what's coming up in this episode. Then over the next few weeks, like I say, I'm going to do some solo one-part episodes. But yeah, for now, it is my absolute pleasure to bring you the second part of my conversation with Professor Cecile Farb. There's, we are, we may be justified yeah. in taking sanctions, we may be justified in taking war or waging war, whatever the verb is there, but we are constrained morally in our ability to do so by proportionality, right? Yeah. Like, you can't kill 10,000 people to save two, essentially. Yes. But essentially. then the question then arises of epistemic uncertainty because both as just an absolute and a comparative if deciding whether to employ a particular course of action period or deciding whether to employ that course of action versus another course of action i.e sanctions versus war we don't know in either of those cases and it strikes me that, that, that we don't know like we really don't know like you've got wars like um I'm not going to touch on the justifiability of these, but you've got wars like the war in Afghanistan where we thought it would just, we'd go in, we'd knock their military down, it would be in and out, and we're in, what, yeah. the 19th year? And then on the other hand, you have something like the Six Day War where people mm-hmm. think this is going to be this decades-long grinding-out struggle and it's just over all it's of a over. sudden. Yeah. And you... You really, really, really don't know. And the same with um, sanctions is it strikes me that you have people impose crushing sanctions regimes on countries in ways that don't affect behaviour at all. And then you have other times when they're like, oh, and by the way, your athletes can't go to the Olympic Games. And they're immediately like, oh, no, 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 hang on, guys, we'll stop. And it's not just so with any application of moral theory there's going to be a case of epistemic uncertainty it seems to me in this case that that epistemic certainty becomes particularly extreme it's not like the case of like we don't quite know how much tax revenue we're going to raise it's like the 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 range of outcomes are so extreme in this case right yeah i agree with you um so that that question of you know what it is that we are morally entitled to do um, or indeed on a duty to do, um, given that we don't know. And it's not just that, you know, given that we don't know, uh, it's also that um, the risks that we are running, um, you know, risks of wrongful killing, you know, on the one hand, but also the risk of failing to save lives, you know, on the other hand. Um, in other words, uncertainty in those cases is a matter of life and death. And uh, unfortunately, um, it's an area in modern political philosophy which is sorely lacking, you know, in sustained, you know, developed uh, work. It is, I think, one of the hardest 
you know, issues at stake in, in those uh, debates. Um, so what I try to say in the book um, is that under those conditions, the least, but also the most that uh, we can expect agents to do, so political leaders, you know, to simplify under those conditions, is to act on the basis of the best, you know, available evidence. Now, that raises, you know, a couple of, at least a couple of issues, you know, um, what constitutes the best you know, available evidence, um, but also what it is that agents may do in order to improve, you know, their epistemic, you know, situation. Um, so there is a neat, you know, connection here. Uh, between um, uh, you know war, economic statecraft, the ethics of foreign policy under conditions of uncertainty in general, um, and the ethics of espionage and intelligence, you know, gathering. Um, so you know, I keep as upon introducing little tangents which aren't helpful to our overall argument, could you say a few words about espionage? Because I know you've worked on this, and I've never met anyone else who has. Well, so there are very few people who work on this. There are there are a few people, a few philosophers who work on this. That's my my project, you know, at the moment. So so, you know, it jumps off, um, uh, you know, this um, concern that I've had. I and others for many years about what it is that we may do, you know, under conditions of uncertainty. Now that question is somewhat different, you know, from the question of what it is that we may do in order to reduce, you know, the level of uncertainty, you know, under which you know we operate. So can we send spies out, mm. you know, discover the land, um, you know, as the Bible um, says, God instructed Moses um, uh, to do. Um, now, um, but you know, that aside, yeah, 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 uh, sorry. On, on the question, on the question of you know, what can, um, what may we do under conditions of uncertainty? Um, well, I think there are two things. You know, one is where well, we we may and must go by the best um, available evidence, but also um, we have to have a view about. Um, uh, the kind of risk that we are willing to take. And I tend to have a fairly precautionary view, you know, there. Um, that, you know, the greater degree, the greater the degree of uncertainty, the less inclined, you know, we should be, you know, to, in my context here, impose, you know, economic sanctions or to withhold, you know, assistance from those, um, you know, those who um, who actually need it. Um, and that, that precautionary view, you know, is underpinned by deeper uh, theoretical commitments about uh, the doctrine of acts and emissions. So I think it's, you know, other things are often equal, morally worse to harm than to allow, you know, harm, you know, to happen. Um, uh, and that explains why, uh, you know, we should be disinclined, you know, to impose sanctions, you know, the greater our uncertainty as to whether or not, you know, sanctions will work, whether or not um, economic agents are responsible for the human rights violations which are enabled by free trade, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't have, I mean, I must admit, I don't have, you know, fully, you know, developed, you know, views uh, on this, so, you know, as I, you know, go deeper, um, you know, into that question in the work on espionage, I may be led to revisit, you know, some of the claims I make, you know, with respect to economic statecraft uh, and uncertainty. Okay, so that all seems like complete common sense, but just hearing it now, an objection occurs to me in real time, which is this. So, there may, in some circumstances we may be justified in either imposing sanctions or going to war. Let's just say imposing sanctions in this case. However, we don't know what the likely results of us imposing those sanctions will be. So we need to just look at the best available evidence, come to our best view, and be moderately risk-averse when we mm. really don't know, right? Yeah. Um, and in some cases, can I just say, in some yeah. cases, that may mean that we ought to do nothing. Mm. You know, neither war nor economic sanctions. So there might be a case where a lot of people are being killed or their rights are violated, but because of uncertainty, we might conclude it's just not worth the risk. In some cases, that's right. But, you know, to, to say that implies that um, it's not really worse under some circumstances to run the risk of wrongfully killing people or, you know, wrongfully contributing to the wrongful death of people, you know, than it is to run the risk of wrongfully failing, you know, to save, you know, those people's lives. 
But it's well, not at I, all. Sorry, I mean, you know, if you think that, you know, um, allowing someone to die is as bad, you know, as killing them or contributing mm. you know, to killing them, um, you know, then you will have a different approach, you know, to the balancing of those various risks, it seems to me. I think even accepting a pure consequentialist, there is no difference between allowing death and yeah. causing a death, which I'm perilously close to holding myself. The right. norm would, the, the utilitarian calculus would still be fairly risk averse in these cases because of epistemic uncertainty. This is John Stuart Mill's whole argument with recourse to war. He says going to war to prevent human rights violations or taking down authoritarians, any moral consequentialist should be in favour of it in theory, but almost always against it in practice, because it tends, it just has a really bad track record. And when assessing the risks, you're assessing, you know, 100,000 people will die if we leave Saddam in power, but the range of outcomes of us taking him out has a mean value of half a million deaths, therefore yeah. we should do nothing. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. that that seems to me actually sensible. Yes, no, so I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, I would want to know, though, um, I want to know more about how utilitarians such as men, you know, would weigh uh, the relative moral merits, as it were, or demerits of you know, actively, um, you know, uh, decreasing utility mm. uh, on the one hand versus failing to promote it, you know, on the other hand, right? I mean, you know, I, I don't know, um, you know, how, uh, you know, he would deal with that. Um, but that's something which I think, you know, using China more theory, you know, should, um, you know, should think about, um, you know. I don't know the answer to that, and it's been forever since I read that essay. The okay. objection, though, that was going to occur to me with that is that all seems so common sense, right? Like, if war, if sanctions are justified before we go ahead and implement them, we have to look at how uncertain we are, what the sort of range of outcomes could be, what potential unintended consequences could be there, right? But then say you have two different states, both right. of which are committing exactly the same human rights violations. They've both killed 10,000 of their own citizens. Yeah. And you say, OK, we have de facto a case for sanctions against both of them and say that case stands. But in right. one case, we have extreme epistemic uncertainty and in the other, we don't. It would seem like a weird outcome where you'd go in and impose sanctions on, and this could very well be a real world case, right? You go in and you impose sanctions on one country, but not the other, for doing the same thing. Well, even, so even though, and I feel like one of those countries could come back to you and say, well, well hang on, like, this other dude was doing the exact same stuff yes. I did, and you yes. punished him and not me. Would he... So uh, yeah, good. So, so um, it, I mean, purely objectively speaking, um, you know, you ought one or two impose sanctions in both, you know, cases. Um, and so, failing, you know, to impose sanctions in the case where, you know, we operate at a very high, you know, level of uncertainty, um, would be objectively wrongful. But the question is, um, you know, what it is that we ought to do, given that. You know, we operate under a very high level of uncertainty in one case and, you know, not you know, in the other. And it seems to me that, um, you know, if we do operate under a very high level you know, of uncertainty um, in any given case, then that may well give us a very strong reason, you know, not to go forward, even though objectively speaking, you know, we may find, or it is the case that, and we may subsequently find that, you know, we should, you know, have gone ahead. So, so I would want to distinguish here between, you know, what is objectively, you know, the right thing to do, um, as a matter of fact, or on fact, you know, relative grounds, as Derek Parfit would have it, and what we are evidence, you know, relative, you know, justified, you know, in doing. I mean, the, the two diverge, you know, they don't necessarily coincide. So our retort to that um, dictator would be, be, you know, we're justified in doing this to both of you yeah. for practical reasons. We're only going to do it to you. And too bad you're a dictator. That, that, I mean, the dictator does not have a grievance. 
So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that... Um, uh, okay, this is interesting. So let me... Um, so there are cases where, you know, treating objectively like cases differently is, um, you know, could be regarded as morally wrong. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting question as to whether or not, you know, someone who has been rightfully convicted of a crime, you know, has a grievance when someone who has committed exactly the same crime under exactly the same conditions get off lightly because he has very powerful, you know, friends. And, you know, some people might say, well, the first wrongdoer, you know, doesn't have a grievance. I mean, you know, this kind of justice is not comparative. Mm. You know, it's not what he deserves. And the fact that the other wrongdoer did not get, you know, what he deserves is irrelevant, right? Um, on, a, on another view, uh, justice is, compar- is, is comparative, you know, in this way. Even if you think in the two murderers or two wrongdoers case that the, the first wrongdoer or murderer has a grievance, whether he does will depend on the reasons why, you know, he did not get off lightly whilst, you know, the other did. Um, in the two dictator case, you know, that you've given me, uh, it seems to me that if the reason why we didn't impose economic sanctions on the second dictator is that we were operating at a very high level of uncertainty, that does not give the first dictator a grievance, it seems to me. Um, so know. it might feel a bit weird, but there's nothing There's nothing yeah. to really but, extract well, from that. I wouldn't worry too much about you know, him feeling a bit weird. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> Although it does feel a bit weird, but like what normative weight you can place on that. Also place on that, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So then let's go finish with um, enforcement then. Yeah. So if there is a case for, if we say we do think property rights with all the qualifiers we put on the table are real things, and that's the de facto norm, there are cases for restricting them in various ways. Um, as a means of combating human rights violations. The final question is who should be doing the restricting. So a lot of people want to sort of make the case that... um, Well, let's just start before we even get to, like, America. Um, The case, do you see there as being an ethical distinction between a particular state unilaterally (laughs) imposing sanctions versus, say, a group of states agreeing to impose sanctions or some sort of non-state body like the World Bank or the IMF or the United Nations. How do you think about the enforcer in this space? So in this particular respect, I have a, a quite an instrumental view you know, of this. So you know, it seems to me that um, uh, an important consideration is not uh, you know, whether or not the uh, enforcer uh, is a state acting unilaterally, um, as distinct from a multilateral institution, um, it's you know whichever of the two uh, is best equipped, you know, to actually do you know the enforcing. And you know sometimes um, uh, you know you might want to say that uh, a state acting on its own. I'll give you an example in a second. You know, um, it might be in a better position, if only because it would be more willing, you know, to enforce you know sanctions um, than a multilateral institution. I mean, the example I have in mind. I mean, it's a problematic example in many ways, but um, it's, you know, when France um, unilaterally intervened far too late, but, you know, unilaterally intervened in the Rwandan genocide, um, you know, when the UN uh, was very unwilling, you know, to, uh, to actually step in. Um, uh, in other cases, um, you know, multilateral institutions, you know, might be better yeah, at enforcing sanctions, um, not entirely for practical reasons, but... Um, for normatively directed, you know, practical reasons. That is to say, a multilateral institution doing it, you know, might do a bit, might be better at enforcing um, in ways that are morally justified, you know, impartially, uh, in particular. Um, but again, you know, my 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 concern um, is who can do it better, um, you know, not the. Um, uh, not the precise makeup or nature, you know, if you will, you know, of that actor. But so then, what you're saying is ultimately what matters is what matters, which is who can get the job done. Um, I think a lot of people would want to sort of say that de facto, and a sort of international institution is better because 
you know, the American government is American and it answers, you know, at least in theory, to American voters, why should, why should that be able to go around and tell other states what to okay. do, whereas the UN coming in feels more neutral, it feels fairer, and you're saying those feelings might matter instrumentally in terms of they might make the UN more effective, but ultimately what, what it comes down to is... Yes. Who's more effective? Yeah, what, what it mostly comes down to. So there is, there is, um, uh, there are two, at least two qualifications to this. You know, one is that sometimes on normative moral grounds, um, uh, it really, you know, may matter um, that, for example, a particular state you know, does, you know, the enforcing. Um, and, and these are cases where that state um, owes a duty of reparation, you know, by dint of its previous, you know, wrongdoings, you know, to the individuals whom it will protect, you know, by means of, you know, economic uh, economic sanctions. Um, the second caveat directly flows, you know, from this. In fact, it goes against what I've just said. That we might argue that in some cases, um, a state is particularly ill-equipped you know, to be the enforcer, not so much because it is a state as opposed to a impartial or seemingly impartial multilateral institution, but precisely because it is guilty or was guilty in the past of you know, similar you know, wrongdoing. So that's the charge of hypocrisy, um, you know, which I you know, deal with in the last you know, chapter you know, of the book. So let's take that on, because... I think you, this is this is a charge worth taking seriously, right? I, so yeah. let me try and give the strongest explanation of this possible. Okay, let's say we agree with the general case for sanctions that we've laid out. You could agree with that while saying absolutely not should the American Republic as it acts currently exists be the current yeah. state to do that and you could just go and read any of Noam Chomsky's books to say do you realize how many times we've intervened in foreign countries for no justifiable or for not fully justifiable reasons and how badly intentioned America has been in doing that for the basest and most cynical yeah. often the most incompetent reasons how often it's used these tools of economic power to prop up dictators around not to get rid of them but to prop them up in its own economic self-interest it has been as as complicit in wrongdoing as any state around the world at that time, except maybe the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so, so just to say that, and you're saying that then these are the people who we're now going to say, yeah, no, we're, we're happy with them, you know, coming in and being the person who will starve children as a means of getting their dictator to behave, they have no standing, they have no authority, and they will be acting, as you say, as complete hypocrites. When we invoke the, uh, the past, or, you know, past, um, you know, human rights violations uh, as a result, not to entrust, you know, the task of enforcing fundamental rights, be it by way of sanctions or by way of conditional assistance, when we when we say well what they did in the past um, counts against them now, you know we need to be very clear as to why. So it could be that you know given what they did in the past, uh, we have no reason to trust that they will be able to do it well, to do it justly now. And I'm very very sympathetic, you know, with this argument. Um, importantly, it has been made that very same argument against international institutions, um, not just against the U.S. Um, can the you IMF has a pretty sordid yeah. history. It, that's right. Um, so that's one, one argument. But there is another argument, you know, which is uh, the following. Even if, uh, you know, the U.S., to take them as an example, could, as a matter of fact, do it well now, notwithstanding, you know, their appalling, you know, track record, that appalling track record... Um, denies them the, sta the standing, you know, to do it now, even if they could do it well. And that, it seems to me, is a much harder objection, 
you know, to deploy, you know, particularly if they could not only do it well, but A, they are the only one willing to do it, and B, they would do it better, you know, than other parties. Um, the, the, the other point I want to make um, is that there is a distinction to be drawn, and I try to draw it uh, in the book, um, between um, two variants um, of, the, um, uh, of the charge of hypocrisy, um, or rather two ways of invoking the charge. You know, one is to say, because of what you did in the past, you, know, you are morally prohibited from enforcing rights now, um, the second you know, claim is very different. It says, because of what you did in the past, you are morally prohibited from condemning now you know, those regimes and so on, so morally condemning those regimes and actors you know, who commit you know, human rights in violations. That this- last claim seems much more problematic to me. Well, so that's interesting because um, I find it slightly more plausible than the former. I mean, so let, let me just um, you know make sure that um, we are on the same page. So, I mean, it seems to me that, um, or I see more easily, you know, the force of the claim that my previous you know wrongdoings deny me the standing to issue moral condemnation against wrongdoers, than I see the force of the claim that my previous wrongdoings prohibits me from helping victims of other wrongdoers here and now. Let's try and concretize this a little. So there's at least three separate claims. There's does your past wrongdoing make you ineffective to act? Does it does it morally prohibit you from acting? Mm-hmm. And does it put you in a position where you could you can't you, you fail to make a moral judgment? At all, you uh, may not make a moral judgment. Um, so you, you you act illicitly by making a moral judgment. So yes, that the, the, these in effect are three. Well, I mean, the, the, I mean the first two, you know, can um, be thought to relate, you know, to each other. If you think that my being ineffective at doing something is a very strong reason as to why I ought not morally to do it. But you know, setting that aside. You know, there is a difference between, to repeat, saying my past behavior, you know, denies me the standing to act here and now, you know, for the sake of victims, and saying my past behavior denies me the standing to condemn, you know, the wrongdoers to which those, of which those people are victims. Let me give you um, a simple, um, just with like some people example of this. So let's just grant the case in the first case that in some cases practically the US um, because perhaps they are less trusted or something like that, it will decrease their efficacy and we have to as a sort of empirical matter we have to take that into account when making decisions. Let's grant that. To tease out the second two, let me give you a case um, that's in your book actually is you reference a case where a kidnapper kidnaps a man and a woman. Mm-hmm. And then, so not just that he's done wrong historically, but that he is actually, or she or whoever, in the um, act of committing a wrong as it happens. Yeah. Um, and while he's kidnapped them, the man tries to rape the woman. Mm-hmm. So in that case, and I think you use it to explicate, the fact that you have done wrong or indeed you are doing wrong doesn't mean that there might not be a justification for you then acting so as to prevent. You know, we would say, you know, even though he's a kidnapper, it's right that he jumped in to intervene to stop one of his kidnapped victims raping the other. That seems correct to me. The second claim would be, can he say it's wrong can he, by virtue of being a kidnapper, is he able to condemn the man for a, 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 an attempted rape? Um, well, surely just as like the, the fact, 
like, like, I can say this table is three feet long. That just seems to be sort of a fact about the world. You can uh, say it's wrong to rape someone. That just yeah, sort of seems to be a moral fact. I mean, the, the epistemic status of those facts are quite different. But but you can just recognise the wrongness yeah. of an action, almost yeah. standpoint independent, right? So I, I don't know, what am I missing? No, so we, we don't we don't disagree about that, um, but we use the word to condemn in slightly different ways. So when I speak of moral condemnation uh, or a you know a condemnatory statement, um, uh, I don't simply have in mind a statement to the effect that doing X raping, for example, or you know um, sending your opponents to jail is morally wrong. You know, I have in mind um, uh, a statement. Um, which um, uh, goes hand in hand with a what Peter Strawson uh, calls a reactive attitude. Um, you know, so it's not just raping is wrong. That the United States, for example, but France, you know, my home country is another good example. Uh, by making those condemnatory statements against you know various um, dictatorial regimes, are uh, um, uh, assuming a position of more superiority you know, by making the statement, uh, to which, in fact, they don't have a claim, and they don't have a claim to it by dint of their previous, you know, wrongdoings. Um, that's the worry um, that the hypocrisy charge is trying to capture. It seems to me one of the worries that it is trying to capture. You can recognise as an object-level fact that particular behaviours are wrong, but to have... Um, not a retaliatory, what was the word you used? A retributive? A condemnatory. Condemnatory. Um, but condemnatory yeah. to you is saying a step beyond merely just recognising the wrongness yes. of an act. It's, yes. it's something about it deserving of punishment? or um, At least uh, uh, deserving of censor, but um, it's not just that. It's um, uh, It seems to me that... Um, when I condemn myself, uh, the, actually, I shouldn't use the um, reflective case because that's more complicated um, and needlessly complicated for my purposes. But, you know, when I condemn, you know, someone for doing something, um, you know, in many cases, um, I, well, if it's not in all, um, I can very easily uh, be taken to um, imply that... I would not do it, you know, myself, that I haven't done it, you know, myself, um, that somehow I'm on the, in this particular, in respect of this particular wrongdoing, I'm on a different moral plane, as it were, you know, from the person whom I'm condemning. Uh, the worry, you know, is that if I have committed the very same kind of wrong or uh, um, irrelevantly, you know, similar kind of wrongdoing, and if I'm not open you know, about this, um, uh, then I expose myself to the charge of hypocrisy. Um, and that, that is what a lot of, you know, the, uh, the states, you know, which um, decides to behave or portray themselves as, you know, enforcers of global norms are exposing themselves, you know, to. It seems to me, though, that that, that entire account would hinge on the phrase without acknowledging it. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, it's complicated because, um, so it, it's complicated. It's not just um, uh, not acknowledging it. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, or, or rather one has to be very clear as to what acknowledging it, you know, means. So um, it would have to be, you know, um, acknowledging in a apologetic, you know, way. So, you know, if um, uh, France were to say, um, we sell arms, you know, to tyrants, or to tyrant A. Um, it's outrageous what tyrant B, you know, is doing, you know, to his people. We're going to sanction on sales, you know, to tyrant B. But nevertheless, you know, we have some moral reasons as to why, you know, we sell arms you know, to tyrant A, lesser evil reasons, France might not thereby expose itself to the precise precise charge of hypocrisy, you know, which I set out in the book. What I find worrying, what a lot of people find worrying, is um, uh, lip service acknowledgement, non-apologetic, you know, acknowledgement. Um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm struggling with this well though, but then what's the sort of purchase on that that I mean in the case of France and the US, we can very easily say that they're actually they actually are hypocrites, right? Yeah. Yes. That, no, that so, seems to me to just, as an object level statement, that seems to be true. That's, but so what that's, falls out of that? It seems to me that the position they're in is directly analogous to the position of the kidnapper preventing a rape in the example in your yes, book. Yes, in yes. That, they are, that they are in the commission of further wrongdoing while also being in a position of power, probably being the only person there who can prevent more wrongdoing in that case. It seems it seems to me directly analogous. And so yes. I, yeah. I think that, you know, the kidnapper should prevent the rape. I think that they, there may be cases, although they are probably very limited, where the US or whoever would want to exercise their power so as to prevent right. further wrongdoing if, you know, taking into account uncertainty and, you know, whatever. Right. Um, what... what f- I, I'm, what's the practical purpose of noting truly and correctly that they are hypocrites? What, oh, what, what, what's, what's the end result of that argument? So, I, I mean, I think um, there, there might not be any practical you know, purpose, um, you know, except that I think it matters that we should be able to um, describe the world you know, as it is. Um, so if it is indeed the case um, that the United States you know, or France or the UN um, uh, or Britain um, or Russia or Israel or China are hypocrites, um, that may not lead us you know, to do very much you know, about it, um, but at least, you know, we will know that this is, you know, what they are, um, you know. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't want to take the view that, um, I don't think we should take the view that um, uh, there is no point to making ju- ju- more judgments. In that instance, the judgment of hypocrisy, you know, if uh, nothing practical follows, you know. I mean, more judgments don't always give rise to practical, you know. No, so, so you're just saying let's honestly describe the world. Let's honestly describe the world. And you know what I want to say. Um, uh, so that statement is one that I want you know to um, uh, to have you know in the interview. Is that you know I do not wish to deny you know that in many cases the charge of hypocrisy or the charge of double standards, which is slightly different, you know, is uh, is justified. You know, it is in many cases you know justified. Um, it doesn't follow that you know those you know hypocrites or peddlers of double standards are morally prohibited. You know, from enforcing, you know, economic, uh, you know, sanctions or resorting to conditional, you know, offers of assistance. Uh, nevertheless, we will have been in a position to recognise them, um, and to some extent, us, you know, on whose behalf, you know, they come to act for who they and we are. So it's more a matter of saying, yes, as a practical matter, the kidnapper should prevent the rape, yeah. but. That let, let's also just let, let's make sure we also do state in our account of that that they are a kidnapper, and yes. that nothing about their actions has made That's that kidnapping justifiable. That's right. So, so they are. I mean, um, this is interesting. So, um, it may be that you know the kidnapper saving the rape victim might have a bearing on uh, the kind of punishment, you know, to which, um, you know, he's liable. You know, you can perhaps make an argument with the effect that, you know, his saving the rape victim should be regarded in mitigation, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, that's fine. Um, I'm not quite sure. I haven't worked out what the equivalent, you know, would be, you know, in the context of international, you know, politics. But even if all of that is true, um, you're right. Nevertheless... Um, we will still have to uh, recognise that he's a kidnapper. Um, and in addition, we will also have to recognise that by taking a position of condemnatory position vis-à-vis the rapist, there is a sense in which you know, he wrongs you know, the rapist by claiming that he, you know, a position of moral superiority, which in fact is not you know, his to claim. So there might be one practical consideration, um, you know, which is that the kidnapper ought to apologise. You know, to the rapist, you know, for having, you know, for having disrespected him in this particular way. You might not think that this has much weight, you know, morally speaking. Um, but even if it does not have much weight, it might have some, 
you know, weight. And again, you know, one could investigate, you know, what the analogy or the equivalent would be, you know, in the realm of um, international politics. Well, the analogy would be um, America claims the right to act and the moral superiority to act, and only one of those is justified. But then, of course, there's an interesting case in that its ability to act is probably predicated on its claiming moral superiority. So the moral superiority claim as an object fact is a hypocritical one, but it's also true that there might be a particular case where the US is the only one capable of acting, and its ability, you know, as a practical matter of real realpolitik, it'd be very hard to imagine an American president saying, look, I understand that I'm just as bad as you, and I understand that we're in the commission of human rights yes. abuses as we do it, but nonetheless, you know, I'm still going to come in and prevent you. It would seem, that would seem, one, just really weird, and two, that their ability to act would be constrained by the correct acknowledgement of that action's hypocrisy. So, no, good. So I think that's a good point. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, there's another one um, uh, that I want to make. Okay, so the point is about the, the, the causality or the causation between claiming moral superiority by dint of making a condemnatory judgment on the one hand and me being able to act you know, on the other hand. So um, one could argue that um, uh, it's not that uh, uh, claiming moral superiority uh, enables America to act, but rather that um, not admitting that it lacks moral superiority is what you know enables America to act. I mean that's a that's a you know a, a twist you know to the argument. Um, but um, yeah, I mean it seems to me that you know, in other words, to put the point more straightforwardly, I mean if it were possible for America to act without uh, claiming moral superiority, um, then that's what America should do. Right. That would be the first best one, in well, that America it's, confesses its sins, it's, that's right. but then or, still or remains, exercises that power in a benevolent way. Or remains, you know, silent. Um, actually, that's not, you know, as um, uh, ivory towerish, you know, as we might, you know, think. Um, you know, the difference that is to say between confessing to crimes, um, uh, explicitly uh, lying, and saying that. We haven't committed crimes and remaining silent. Um, you know, the extent to which uh, you know uh, communities are willing to um, to hide you know past wrongdoings under a veil of collective amnesia is quite extraordinary. Um, but you know, hiding under a veil of collective amnesia to repeat you know is not you know the same as openly claiming um, that uh, there is nothing to be hidden. So you might there draw a practical distinction, um, like between the way, um, say, Obama and Trump express themselves about the role of America, in that Obama didn't do enough to own its past evils, but he sort of acknowledged that they were there, and he never pretended the yeah. US completely had its hands clean. Whereas Trump... Trump the- sees all of that as glorious. Yes, yes. And so yes. just, we, we should prefer Obama. I mean, there's an obvious conclusion to end on. We should yes. prefer Obama to Trump. So on, that, on that count um, as well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So shall we leave it at that? Yes, I think so. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed that conversation, actually. Um, but thank you anyway. I really, um, I really appreciate it. No, thank so. you for coming back. <laughs>